Sacred attention therapy is an approach to liberation. The first liberation is from the conditioned self, psychology of early life. The second liberation is from the realization of the true nature, the fulfillment of oneself as a personality. And the third liberation is the liberation into the life of spirituality and spiritual practice. Sacred Attention Therapy, or SAT, is a meta-psychology because it embraces not only the physical, emotional, mental and energetic aspects of the human being, but also the spiritual and the transcendental. Therefore, it is uniquely placed to be an applied psychology through counselling and psychotherapy in the 21st century in which human beings are more complex than ever before. Welcome to the second in a series of online interviews with Richard Harvey. My name is Rob Meager. Today's interview will discuss the lecture, Being Born a Human Being, from the Turnian Talks. This lecture is available in written form in Bodhi Ocean, an ebook that is available on the books page of the Sacred Attention Therapy website. You can listen to the full recording of many of these lectures in the lectures page. And lastly, you can view many other interviews on the videos page of the Sacred Attention Therapy website or on our YouTube channel. The URL for our website is www.sacredattentiontherapy.com. And on our website, you can click on the YouTube channel icon to view our YouTube channel. And now a little bit of background about Richard Harvey. He's a psychospiritual, psychotherapist, and spiritual teacher. His work emerged out of the human potential movement of the 1970s. He trained with many teachers in humanistic and transpersonal approaches. He's the founder of Sacred Attention Therapy, a radical new approach to inner work for the 21st century that proposes a three-stage model of human awakening. Richard is the author of Your Essential Self and the Flight of Consciousness, among many other publications. He works with people all around the world, and his forthcoming book is entitled Your Sacred Calling. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Richard Harvey to the interview. Thank you, Robert. Good to be with you. I'm with you. You open the lecture, Being Born a Human Being, with a beautiful poem you wrote, but it's the same name, and the poem was titled Being Born a Human Being. Now, I'm not going to recite the entire poem, because it was rather lengthy, um, but, but I'll summarize that the poem invites us to the awareness of the gift it is to be born a human being. And that gift is that we're given the opportunity Opportunity to be self-aware and to self-reflect. And in the awareness and reflection, we can return to our true selves. And what I wanted to ask to begin our interview today, Richard, is when in the human being form, in your lifetime, did you realize this gift of what it was to be born a human being? I, um, for me, the, the awakening has been gradual and the awakening has been a um, catching up with an original 
birth given state perhaps I look at it differently as I age even more and I certainly looked at it differently in my 30s my 20s my 40s and so on but um, the condition it seems to me was one which I could make no sense and have no reference for at all and looking back that's a tremendous um, gift in itself because it's a trial it's a test um, you are I was um, able to resist the outside world really mm. I was ab able to uh, put it at bay I didn't much believe in it really when, when I was young it seemed to me it was fake because in contrast to some inner uh, condition that I couldn't explain, certainly couldn't reflect or discuss or have any reference points for at all. Uh, there was something of great um, moment, something of, of awe, something of um, transcendent reality. Not that I would have had any of those words. So I did the usual things like go to a church and try and talk to people and things like that and nothing would come out and it wasn't until I was uh, 24 when I stumbled into um, this crazy sort of era in the mid 70s in Europe of uh, exploring inner worlds psychologically and um, you know relationally spiritually soulfully and in, in all kinds of ways that I think the idea of awakening, though we used different terms in those days, we used terms like raising consciousness and, of course, personal growth and whatnot. Um, and it was really a hodgepodge of spiritual and psychological methods that were experimental. That people were trying to do something out of an innate dissatisfaction. And I think then, at that point, it occurred to me that we were all trying to kind of move dimensions in some way, a kind of an awakening. Mm -hmm. And since then, it has um, it's changed uh, through the decades, I think, in terms of fashion. You know, fashionably, uh, people have different views about what it all means. And even now, of course, it's a blunt instrument in some ways because an awakening, <laughs> awakening can be a um, exalted human experience, very often is, in the temporal realm. On the other end of the stick, it can be a timeless experience in the eternal and single moment of transcendental uh, event with a, without any source whatsoever. Only then is it, uh, I think we should strictly define it as a spiritual uh, event of any kind. Strictly speaking, there aren't spiritual events because events take place in space and time. But um, So we've traveled a distance with it over the last, say, 50 years. Mm. And now perhaps we have to be very careful in, in what it is we're saying and what it means, and especially since it seems to imply a transformation or a change, which in actual fact is, uh, you know, but I won't labor the point we've talked about it in some ways, preparation for the spiritual uh, discipline, the spiritual life, the sadhana, which is eternal, and not in and of itself uh, spiritual, any more than base camp and preparing mm. our equipment is actually uh, scaling the mountain itself, you might say. Mm. Mm. Hmm. You speak a lot about that, I believe, in your essential self as well as other lectures. Mm. Um, you go on to talk about those who, quote, answer the call versus those who remain asleep, and I'm going to um, to share um, with those uh, listening, watching, as well as a reminder to you of, of this quote from the lecture. You say the alternative to responding to the call is to attend to the necessities of life exclusively: work, making money, conforming, raising a family, getting promotions at work, climbing the professional ladder, working. Around the year, week after week, day after day, paying the bills, saving for vacations, providing for dependents. All, all these and many more pursuits are liable to become our overwhelming preoccupations as we straddle the path between birth and death. The materialistic life decrees that love, relationships, duty, responsibility, worldly success, and living up to family and societal expectations is validation enough. 
in an uncertain world, a world where some fall by the wayside or lose their way altogether, it is enough to behave well and virtuously, to see if you can obtain the approval of your peers, your relatives, and your friends, to achieve some status, however humble or exalted, during your lifetime. So broadly speaking, there are two ways, two alternatives, hearing and responding to the call, or before becoming overwhelmed by the necessities of human life. And so the question I have for you, um, it's a bit biased, uh, I'll, I'll admit, but what is the healer to do when the seeker in front of them chooses to not hear the call? <clears throat> the seeker brings uh, his or her own uh, predilection, his own tendency, doesn't he? And uh, we, I think, we receive the um, co the condition of the psycho-spiritual seeker, and we see whether his or her attention are uh, is drawn towards what he. This is the meditation. This is the focus of awareness. Mm -hmm. We say. And we meet, of course, the seeker in that place. We say, well, you know, how's this going? How's the relationship? How's your work? How's family life? How's, you know, how's your car? How's the kitchen? You know, ordinary things. You know, our life is full of ordinary things. It's not as if the sacred spiritual life is very much different, if at all, than the a sacred, a spiritual life. It's just that it's... Uh, from a subjective viewpoint, um, doing these ordinary mundane things, um, they are all shot through with transcendence. There, there's light in all these things. There's love in all these things or compassion in all these things. There's, outwardly, of course, they don't necessarily look like you're doing anything other than sweeping the floor or you know, driving the car, going shopping or what, what have you. Although, curiously, when you yourself reach that place, you can recognize it in others, but you know very clearly it's like the nose on their face that, that that's been a curiosity for me because people will say, "You know I'm in this place or I'm in that place, and I will either share if I'm asked or think privately, you know no, you're not, or yes, you are, depending it's just very, very clear. Mm. But I think as healers, guides, uh, counsellors or whatever, of course you meet the person where they are. We certainly don't insist, do we, that um, mm -hmm. there is a spiritual motivation that somehow isn't there. At the same time, we know, unless there is this fundamental, radical, intense thirst for real wisdom, for real illumination, uh, it can't happen. And that's why we're very often... Uh, rather overwhelmed with dissatisfaction or misery or unhappiness or, of course, basic suffering um, as a kind of uh, part of the process of coming to a point where the person will drop their distraction in the, all of those things. It takes so much time and move into the path of the heart. Mm -hmm. Which is why I remember in our last satsang saying at the end, just encouraging people to make more space, have more space, have more time, more uh, expansion in life to breathe. And it seems very often to be the most helpful thing and the most difficult thing to impart to people and that they might respond to. More space, you know, less doing do you need all that money? I mean, do you need the, you know, except, do you need the next movie? Do you need the next whiskey? And mm -hmm. maybe, maybe not. You know, let's see. Mm -hmm. Maybe nothing. Maybe space. Mm -hmm. And then the heart can enter. Mm -hmm. And then the the you know the numa, the spiritual the espiritus can come in. Just awareness of mm -hmm. breath is enough to start. Mm -hmm. A little bit of patience on our part can go a long, long way. Quite. <laughs> you offer a very interesting teaching about true renunciation not coming from the ego. And here's a brief quote from the lecture. Releasing yourself of attachments is not going to the opposite extreme. Releasing is letting go, really letting go. Ultimately, you have to 
released of being attached to be unattached. Ego attaches to any extreme, any opposite. End quote. What are you saying here, Richard? <laughs> is, is, is this about detachment versus unattachment? And isn't, quote, really letting go, end quote, simply another form of renunciation? Well, yes. I mean, what I'm, what I'm saying is what we tend to do when we're out of alignment with ourselves, let's say we're sort of too far this way, is we tend to react, as I think we know, it's our human nature, by going this way. So, you know, we work really hard and then we have a holiday on the beach or something and then we get a bit bored because we've got nothing to do or, you know, it has its own advantages and disadvantages. Somehow this holiday makes up for all the deanness and all this kind of thing. It turns out, however, as I know you know and I think you know that I know, is the way is here. Mm. You can lead your life in these enormous swings, so neurotically or you know, perhaps becoming a workaholic or whatever for achievement, in order to have one halcyon day later in the year or in your old age or whenever you think it's going to be, this time when you're just relaxing, <laughs> as if it's an outer business anyway, which it isn't, um, or you bring it together in a harmony of life where you breathe, you work, you breathe, you work. The, you know, the life is pulsating, so to speak. And you don't think in terms of correcting this misalignment by going this far over here. Therefore, attachment reflexes with unattachment over here, but freedom lies somewhere through the middle, of course, on you know the, 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 the hair bridge over the chasm of fire, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, in the place of non-attachment. So neither are you attached, attached to attachment, neither are you attached to unattachment, mm -hmm. but rather you're disinterested right. in, in, in either. And that's middle in the middle, isn't it? Straight through. Where, where the middle way is the Buddhist. Well, the middle way, as the, the Buddhists say, as a way um, to transcend suffering, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You share an immensely uh, common sense passage on the body and our mortal and the paragraph here is what you have to say the fundamental spiritual wisdom of life is this look after your body and take care of your basic needs your body and its needs are holy and your body provides you with a vehicle for the ordeal and the imbibing of wisdom in the relative world time and space erode the body the body only only lives for a certain length of time, but you are mortal soul and spirit eternal. You reflect the deep knowledge of your humanness with these spiritual human practices. Even in a way that enhances your health, wear clothing that is comfortable and preserves the body. Take exercise that is sufficient to meet your needs in a balanced and intelligent way. Avoid imbalance in your diet, discomfort in your clothing and shelter and extremes in your taking exercise to keep the body in health and alignment, end quote. The Buddhists, I believe, speak of three great desires or distractions we must overcome in our lifetime. And you've spoken about this as well in the lectures, they being sex, food, and money. Where does our relationship to the body enter the, into the picture of these three great desires or distractions that must be overcome in our lifetime? I think it's important to realize as a backdrop to this question, there's only ever two things going on. There's the ego delusion and there's the eternal or there's God. Let's always think in terms of one or other of these and only ever one or the other, as opposed to this idea that they're somehow merging and, you know, the ego could be somewhat godlike or spiritual or anything. There's only ever two things going on. And I think with Buddha's teaching, um, say Ramakrishna's teaching, which um, um, reflects it to some degree. And Ramakrishna was constantly exhorting people to uh, resist, um, uh, as he put it, w at least in the translation, women and money. Patriarchal sort of point of view, but there it is. 
the issue really isn't uh, money or sex or food in and of itself. It's just that the renunciation of any of these things tends to come from this point of alignment, reflexing with the other one, and then we somehow make these things bad. I mean, there's nothing bad inherently in anything in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So these things are not bad, but they point up the uh, intense focus of ego support. This is a way in which the ego can uh, preen itself or conceal itself from its emptiness, really. Um, so you know that people may, not everybody, but you know some people may have money because of an inner uh, emptiness. I mean, that's for sure. We know that. Um, some people can have sex because of lack of inward relationship with themselves and some people of course eat food as a comfort because they don't in and of itself find life a supportive comforting secure matter event so these uh, three which reflects also with the uh, energy system are symbols really they're symbols and in and of themselves, I don't think, I wouldn't have thought even Buddha is trying to say they are in and of themselves are bad, but as ego supports for the primary energy centers in your body, they can be um, and, and do tend to be what we flock to to conceal the, um, the, la the, the emptiness of ego. Mm. There's nothing in there unless we're doing those things. Mm -hmm. So from an ego point of view, you know, in order to conceal the emptiness, you've got to be engaged in these intense activities in some way to, mm -hmm. um, to as, as a subterfuge. Yes, to make it real, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. You speak of spiritual ignorance in the lecture, which is an interesting term. And, and you say the following, very, very brief, just a couple of sentences. Contemplation leads inevitably to the all, and along the way you encounter spiritual ignorance. It is a humbling experience, a childlike experience, and it works like this. And so my question is, is what is spiritual ignorance? How does it work? We don't know what anything is. And you know, you and I, you know, we live in uh, post the age of reason, the so-called age of enlightenment, the age of this, that and the other, and now uh, technological age or the information age, whatever. You know, all of these things imply that we somehow know and we know more and we've had Einstein and great beings and we somehow know even more and all this kind of thing. In actual fact, from a spiritual point of view, um, if there's a challenge um, that sums up the motivation of preparation for a lifetime sadhana, by which I mean um, sp sacred spiritual life, um, where everything is uh, spiritual discipline, spiritual practice, then it is the ability to live in this don't know place not a don't know place that reflexes with the do know i'm going to find out how it works or anything like this it is simply this is a mystery in spite of darwin in spite of science in, in spite of einstein and freud and jung and you know great minds and all this what do we actually know about anything at all when you really look at it and this is something that i um innately have always had i've always had this um questioning sort of uh, mind that wanted to say to people who knew uh, why is that i mean how is that how's that what's that and i remember being in hospitals with my children when they had various ailments and sometimes the doctors didn't know and you would try and nail them and say well what's this and what does this mean and what does that mean and i one day i actually got one in a lift and i said i said can you tell me what's going on with my daughter? She's lying there, or, you know, this is happening and that's happening. And he said things, and I said, well, what is that? Well, what's that? What's that? What's that? And he was stuck in this lift with me, and as we got to the sort of third floor, he couldn't get away. He finally looked at me and he said, I don't know. I said, thank you. you know, that's really, really what I wanted um, is that honesty. Now I can be with this. I don't know. I, we, none of us know, and, but none of us are kind of posing 
as somebody who does know. I'd say you know, the spiritual teacher, the the um, um, the spiritual master, the guru is somebody who doesn't know and isn't afraid of profoundly not knowing. And in that way leads us to that place too, where we're just uh, able to reside in the mystery in a state of profound wonder. That is communion with God, perhaps. I think that's a good way of describing it. Spiritual ignorance. Mm -hmm. I think it's a nice place to leave near you on where God is, so. this spiritual ignorance. Yes. Um, thank you, Richard. It was good to be with you. And with you. And until our next time together. Hmm. Bye for now, Robert. Bye-bye.